Hello and welcome back to Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers, the podcast devoted to exploring the frontiers of psychedelic medicine and mental health. I'm clinical psychologist Dr. Steve Thayer, and today my co-host Dr. Reed Robison and I are joined by Bob McNutt. Bob is a social worker and therapist who uses ketamine-assisted psychotherapy to treat a variety of mental health conditions, particularly trauma. In this episode, we discuss the details of pairing ketamine with several different psychotherapy modalities, um, but especially EMDR. Really enjoyed talking to Bob. Please enjoy our conversation. All right, gentlemen, welcome back to Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers. I thought today we could talk really specifically about the therapy part of psychedelic therapy. And um, we brought uh, Bob McNutt here, one of our therapists at Cedar Psychiatry. Um, and we'll have Bob introduce himself a little bit. But um, we're going to talk, I hope, about different kinds of psychotherapy modalities that we have some experience with or know about that are often paired with psychedelics, ketamine in particular. Bob does a lot of EMDR, so we'll do a deep dive talking a bit about pairing EMDR with ketamine and the variety of ways that we do it. Um, But I think, you know, for our audience, whether you're a prescriber, whether you're a psychotherapist, a guide, a researcher, um, I know when I was first interested in psychedelic psychotherapy, uh, the thought came to me like, okay, there's lots of different ways to do psychotherapy. Um, What ways pair well with the ways with, you know, different psychedelic medicines? So that's my preamble. Bob, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit? Hey, thanks, Steve. Uh, my name's Bob McNutt, a therapist here at Cedar Psychiatry, a social worker, and uh, I've been practicing therapy for about five years. Um, prior to that, worked in a lot of different residential centers for teens with various different problems. Um, right now, focusing a lot on trauma and suicidality for the clientele that I have right now. And so ketamine has come in very useful because it helps a lot with people who want to kill themselves and it helps a lot with people who have expansive trauma in their history. And so I'm finding it very useful. Mm -hmm. Amen to that. What brought you, like what sparked your interest in ketamine earlier in your career? Like what brought you this work? Um, Back when I worked at the... uh, behavioral unit in a hospital one of the doctors I worked with there was constantly talking about his experience with ketamine um, with people who were suicidal and he was able to take a lot of the people that I saw come into the hospital with suicidal ideation give them a ketamine treatment at his clinic and then I'd see suddenly they felt dramatically better Mm -hmm. with almost no time at all And so comparing that to the usual experience of somebody who comes to the hospital for suicidal ideation, it, it really showed itself as a magical drug that I needed to learn more about when I saw it five, six years ago. And so spent some time researching it, various ways of assuming that this is a hoax of some sort, and then probably believing too much in it and then finding the balance of, yeah, this is, this is a very useful medicine. Um, that has a lot, a lot of strengths to it that we can utilize in a lot of different ways. That's a very relatable, like, stages of change when you mm-hmm. get excited about, a, like, a new treatment. Right. You know, you, your disillusion with treatment as usual, um, sort of successful, not successful in other ways. You discover something new that has promise, and you become kind of an acolyte, like, you know, you're this uh, uh, champion of, oh, my gosh, psychedelics, ketamine, they're going to solve all our problems. Um, and then, you know, you get a more mature measured enthusiasm i think with experience right. yeah. stages of grief with the denial <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah a little bit of yeah. grief too i'm sure and so in the last about two years i've been doing a lot of psycholytic therapy with ketamine and so um the psycholytic dose is typically going to be noticeably weaker than the psychedelic dose. Yeah, let's talk about what we mean when we say psycholytic. Not everyone's going to know what that means. So the the psycholytic dose, um, if we're talking about dosage itself, is typically for my patients between 1 and 200 milligrams of an oral ketamine. Sublingual? Sublingual. So they're not swallowing it necessarily. They're waiting for it to absorb under the tongue. Correct. And Reed would probably have a better idea of how much they're actually absorbing of that. I don't know those stats yeah. quite as well. No, it's a good point. It might be worth backing up to where it even comes from. Psycholytic uh, 
psychedelic therapy dates back to the 60s when people would give a low dose of LSD for a more interactive session versus a high dose that would be more internal and ego dissolving. So when we talk about it in ketamine, it's basically a low dose uh, given in whatever form. Lozenges happen to be a really well-suited one for that, but we do it with nasal spray sometimes. We do it with a tiny dose of an injection sometimes or a couple injections. We could even drip IV slowly and interact, but psycholytic means interacting th with the psychotherapist where the psychedelic creates a state of openness and psychedelic is more of a transformation inward journey. Yeah, and we have other clinicians in this space that would refer to the psych psycholytic uh, approach as the trance state. Is yeah, that right? that's what Phil Wolfson, one of right. our mentors, calls it, trance and transformation right. in the ketamine-assisted psychotherapy papers uh, that he's written. Right. Yeah, so we're going for a sub-psychedelic dose. We're not sending them on a trip necessarily. We're, As Reed said, we're going for... Uh, the states of openness, access to emotion and thoughts that might we might other otherwise have trouble accessing because right. of you know uh, blocks and barriers and insecurities. And so the the way that I look at it is the walls are lower. Mm -hmm. You can still feel them; they're not gone. But you can, you can vault them though. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll still feel emotional pain, but it's tolerable. Mm -hmm. And it, it makes it a lot easier. And so the, the people on the psycholytic dose, the room's not spinning. It may have a little bit of dizziness and it may be moving a little bit, but it's not spinning the way that it would be on a psychedelic dose. And they're verbal enough to keep up a conversation, but they're going to be a little bit slower and maybe not have as many big words used but we're still going to be able to access emotions. We're still going to be on the same page with each other. Um, and so it's, it's a good middle ground when we need to access content in an intentional way, but it's scary content. Right. I remember uh, in the early days when we were doing this work here and we had a shared client, Bob, mm -hmm. I, I sent uh, someone I was seeing for some med management to you for psycholytic therapy. And I remember as we were trying to find the dose, one of the first sessions I was asking you how it went and how the dose was of that loss engine. You're like, well, it was great until she fell asleep during the session for 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah. And then we were back. Yeah. And so it, it can be a different dose person to person. And so mm -hmm. sometimes you've got to really just walk it into the right dose. And with the sublingual, especially sometimes the absorption rate can be a little bit different. And so I've had a person come in with the same dose three weeks in a row and one out of those times they weren't as deep as the other times but yeah. it was the same dose and the same amount of time and it was just shows you how many factors go into the experience not just set and setting but the internal factors of right. of uh your openness and whether you've eaten or not and uh how much you slept things like that mm -hmm. right and so with the, with the psycholytic dose, um, typically if we're doing a psycholytic dose, we've got a target in mind, um, whether it be letting go of something or processing a trauma or accepting an emotion, we're coming into this session with a game plan of some sort. Um, with the psychedelic dose, we go a little bit more open, freewheeling with it and kind of follow the journey. But with psycholytic, we we've got a goal in mind. We don't always follow the path and reach that goal. Sometimes the medicine will take us in a different direction and we embrace that and go in a different direction, but there is a, a firmer structure in place with a psycholytic dose. Um, so let's, let's go into a little more detail about EMDR first. Yeah, I've got some, uh, some ideas about talking about other therapeutic modalities. I think later let's talk about uh, psychotherapy principles generally that maybe apply across the spectrum um, and their relevance to, to ketamine assisted therapy. But I want to hear about how you pair EMDR with CAP. Sure. Um, so EMDR for, a, uh, is it the acronym? Yeah. Yeah. The acronym right. stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, um, which in and of itself doesn't explain a whole lot. Um, basically, 
if you're seeing me, I'm going to wave my hand in front of your face, have you move your eyes back and forth one way to the other. Tracking the hand. Tracking the hand. And we're going to do it relatively quick. Um, So you're going to maybe get a headache, maybe get a little bit dizzy as we're doing it. Um, And that... Theoretically, I've never done this while watching a brain scan of what it's doing, but it opens up different areas of the brain to access traumas, access fears, feel them in the moment in a more controlled way. Now, is it supposed to mimic rapid eye movement like the REM during sleep? Is it supposed to try to like have that deliberate action, access neurological processes that are similar to REM sleep? Have you I, heard that? I have been told that, but I am not educated deeply enough in this, the theory behind the modality sure. to be able to answer that firmly. Fair enough. And, and there's, a, there's a lot of experts. So the people that trained me are the Imdria, M, it's difficult to say, mm-hmm. E-M-D-R-I-A, Imdria trainers. Um, and so if you have deeper questions about what's going on inside the brain, those would be the people to talk to because they know the brain answers about this stuff where yeah. I'm more of just the, I've used it, I've practiced it, I've seen that it worked, and there is a meat sack inside of that skull that's doing some stuff with it. That's, that's good enough for me. Yeah, this is probably beyond the scope of this episode to <laughs> completely give an education about EMDR. But. Um, and so the, the intention is we're going to access some traumatic and difficult memories and emotions And we're going to try and desensitize them partially with the eye movement itself and partially with the way that we're responding to the stimulus of the trauma. You know, and when I was in grad school and and talking about EMDR, I remember hearing from one one of my professors that it's the exposure component of EMDR that does most of the heavy lifting Mm -hmm. for change. And there's lots of other exposure oriented therapies that, Mm -hmm. uh, that address trauma. But what's, what's your experience? So the exposure is an important aspect. I would say that the combination of the exposure with a change in automatic reactions of behaviors and emotional reactions mm. is what's required. So exposure the of itself. Part. Yeah. The exposure itself isn't going to heal you if we don't change the emotional response and behavioral response. Right. If I respond with fear every time I have a stimulus, now you're just traumatizing me by making me relive it. Mm. And so exposure itself is dangerous if you're not doing it right. And so we do have to be able to replay these in a different way. And so the way that we do that with EMDR is we're focusing on patterns of negative beliefs that are held based on traumas. And so you're going to isolate things that I believe about myself, things I believe about the world based on my traumas. And we want to change the response to those. We want to be able to change those beliefs, hopefully. If I have a belief that I'm worthless, I want to be able to shift that and to say, there are ways that I can express my value. Mm -hmm. Or maybe even if I'm lucky, I find value in myself intrinsically. Can you give us a little example of that? Say you were working with Steve Mm -hmm. doing EMDR and you're guiding him through consciously with intention his trauma and you get to something he says uh, that exposes a narrative of negative Mm self-worth like will you pause him there and challenge it or how does that look no in that moment we so with the EMDR you're going to do a handful of preparation sessions before you actually get to the eye movement itself and so in those preparation sessions I'm constantly looking for those narratives of worthlessness and unsafety and self-hatred and they are shockingly common for everybody regardless of trauma or not and once you start hearing them you can't stop hearing them and so they are everywhere everywhere and easy to pick apart Um, and so once we've gotten to the point of eye movement we already know what the negative belief is and what a hopeful replacement is there may be new ones that come up. I'll jot those down. We'll discuss those. Do so you discuss them after? You're after taking the... notes, but you're going, you're staying the course yeah. of taking him through his trauma without getting outside of his window of tolerance and overwhelming the system. Correct. So he can be under this idea that the only way out is through, but you've got to do it in a non-re-traumatizing way. Right, right. right. And this is, 
this is always going to be uncomfortable. If there's not discomfort, you're not going deep enough. But the window of mm-hmm. tolerance is exactly the right word. And how do you gauge discomfort or uh, where they are in that window of tolerance? Like, what are the things you look for as a therapist during? The biggest thing I look for is dissociation that is running out of control. Um, there's going to be a natural dissociative effect from the ketamine medicine itself. There's going to be more of dissociated looking eyes when you're moving somebody's eyes rapidly because they're going to be a little oh, blinky and wow, my eyes kind of hurt and I'm a little dizzy. Um, but watching somebody go only into the memory itself, that's where I'm going to hit the brakes and bring them back into reality. Um, so dissociation is the biggest thing I'm looking for and also stuck emotions. I'm okay with having somebody experience a very, very uncomfortable emotion that may peak out of their window of tolerance for five, six seconds. But if we get stuck out of that and we are enraged or sobbing uncontrollably, then we need to come back to reality. And it's, it's shocking how quickly we can come back into the window of tolerance mm-hmm. when the person's willing to do the work. What techniques do you use to bring someone back when it's uh, when it's stuck in a negative when they are stuck in a negative affective state? The the most powerful one is good old fashioned deep breathing. Mm-hmm. There's really nothing too complicated about it. We will do a safe container kind of imagery about how can we lock something up in a place where it's still retrievable. We're not repressing it. We're not ignoring it. We can bring it back. But I find that deep breathing really, with a small visualization of putting something away, can get us back into a window of tolerance. It won't get you back down to, I'm comfortable, but it'll get you back to a place Mm -hmm. where you can process. It reminds me of a technique I really like from somatic experiencing and Peter Levine's modality, one of the OGs in modern trauma therapy of, you know, you're swinging this pendulum into that uh, difficult area. Um, and as that uh, distress starts to mount, you're swinging back into an oasis spot mm-hmm. through, say, guided imagery or back to that uh, peaceful, serene beach and then into the difficult place. But you know you're touching in and out of it to practice without overloading the system entirely. Right, yeah. exactly. And I, I find it useful for people to get to a 10 out of 10 and be able to come back down to a 6 within 15 seconds. yeah. And so there is benefit to temporarily going outside of the window of tolerance as long as you know that you can get it back in. And I'm confident that everybody can get their window of tolerance returned. Yeah, that's the mm-hmm. difference between like cognitive rational learning and embodied learning. When you've brought somebody to a 10 and you've shown them that they can go from a 10 back down to a six that's tolerable, then maybe they're more willing to go there in the future. You know, that's right. the principle behind exposure. These are corrective experiences and, uh, you know, it gives you confidence. It shows you that uh, you can do this. Right. You know? Yeah, I like to say that competent, or excuse me, confidence is built on competence. So if you yeah. now feel competent in how to bring yourself down from a 10 to a 6, you can have confidence that you'll be able to do it in the future, that you'll be able to explore and plumb the depths of your psyche that were scary to you before. Because their fears, just like all of our fears, are a lot bigger in our mind than they are in real life in general. Um, Yeah, but little victories in the therapy room or the ketamine room usually translate into big victories in life. Right. Mm -hmm. And one thing I've noticed within that window of tolerance for the ketamine assisted EMDR is that it seldom is a problem mm-hmm. when there's the ketamine medicine included is people can conceptualize the pain of a 10 out of 10, but not necessarily have to experience every inch of that pain. They can identify it. They can connect with it, but there is that more of an observation rather than feeling it entirely. Mm-hmm which I think is a benefit and a drawback in its own way. Because it's a dissociative anesthetic and has a calming quality. Right. So you can go there without uh, as much difficulty as 
exactly do it otherwise and yeah. so it, it gives the benefit of being able to say oh well that's not that big of a deal i can handle this mm -hmm. but then it has the drawback of saying if i hit that without the medicine i may not feel that confidence that Steve, you were mentioning yeah. of that competence of being able to pull myself out of it. It's like psychic training wheels, and eventually you got to take the training wheels off. But hopefully, you've had experience balancing the bike where both of the training wheels weren't on the ground. You know, right. where you're held by a supportive therapist in a safe container, right. and you have a medicine that facilitates the experience in a non-overwhelming uh, way. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So, Bob, are you are you doing the bilateral stimulation? Uh, with a psycholytic dose on board? Yes. And then are you ever doing EMDR work like that at the psychedelic dose? And so I haven't done it on the psychedelic dose because I don't own tappers. And there's a few reasons I don't own tappers. Uh, most for, of them are arbitrary. For the, for the audience members who don't know what tappers are. Uh, but tappers are vibrating pads that rather than moving somebody's eyes back and forth, you can give them vibrating pads that will vibrate alternating left, right, left, right, left, right, and the clinician controls the frequency, the intensity of those vibrations. That makes sense because, you know, at a, at a, a psychedelic dose of ketamine, it's going to be tough to move your eyes back and forth right. and track somebody's hand. Mm -hmm. um, plus, you might not be 100% there right. uh, to do that kind of work. And so I have done, um, I've done, uh, what? Mm. Read. <laughs> What uh, Reed was mentioning earlier about a client we shared where she fell asleep during the dose, mm -hmm. there were a handful of times where she was at the higher level of the dose and we could not do eye movement with her. But mm. she brought her spouse in with her to session. And so what he did is he would give her bilateral stimulation on a slow pace, which is more used for integration rather than desensitization. And she would give us little clue ins based on what her experience was based on just short statements of colors hmm. and i had been working with her long enough that her tone and her choice of color was meaningful enough to say okay let's slow down the stimulus let's end the stimulus and her husband was able to do that processing in what's called butterfly hug tapping for her interesting can you and, talk more oh go ahead uh, and basically what we were focusing on in that was more of the installation of the positive aspect, knowing that her dose was a little higher than we wanted, and so she was in a calmer state. Her husband was there. She was feeling connected to him. And so being able to do a slow tap installation where really as the clinician, I was just sitting back and making sure that the husband wasn't squeezing too fast because we don't want untrained people to ever do rapid Mm -hmm. bilateral stimulation but slow bilateral stimulation can be useful and so i was more coaching him on duration and comments that he could whisper to his wife while she was giving us small clue ends of where she was at in her journey mm, that's really neat to give the coaching skills to the spouse the partner and just to think about how that will come in so handy in day-to-day -day life. But I wanted to ask on the colors, how did you use colors? Was that to help you understand where they are in this spectrum or their experience? Yeah, and she was basically giving classic mood colors, mm -hmm. like, ah, oh, it's green, it's green, Ooh, yellow, some yellow, oh, there's the orange, it's okay though. And that was pretty much the extent with five, 10 minutes of silence in between each of those statements. You didn't get into like blazing red territory? We didn't get know. into blazing red, which was okay. Hmm. I would have been okay with going to blazing red, but we didn't get there that time. And I, I wouldn't necessarily expect blazing red when her husband is there offering physical and emotional support Mm -hmm. the whole time so back in backing up a bit again um, could you summarize why you find ketamine plus EMDR a good combination yes uh, both are very hands off for the therapist in how much they input verbally um, with the ketamine experience you are allowing the medicine and the person to direct and you're asking questions but not offering a lot in the way of intervention. 
and it's really getting out of the way of the self-healer. And with EMDR itself, the eye movement, opening up parts of the brain, the being physically close to the person so that you can have your hands close enough to move their eyes around, um, the utilization of deep breathing and mindfulness constantly to keep the person from getting too dissociative is really allowing the person to get out of the way of their inner healer. And so if the person gets out of the way of their inner healer and the therapist gets out of the way of the inner healer, you've got a great combination there. You know, this prompts a, a broader discussion, I think, about what is psychotherapy and why does psychotherapy work? So we've talked about the inner healer on other podcast episodes and elsewhere and, and the, the training that we've done for our clinicians here. It's something you hear a lot about um, transpersonal psychotherapy, non-directive psychotherapy approaches that inside all of us, we have this innate f organizing force that if the environment's facilitative will lead us to health, right? Um, and I remember studying the psychotherapy outcome literature earlier in my career, and there's this sort of war between people who think it's the specific factors of the particular interventions. So I'm gonna take you through this 12 session course of cognitive behavioral therapy and the things that are gonna make you well are the interventions that I uh, use. You know, I'm gonna help you identify cognitive distortions and help you drill down to the negative core beliefs and replace them with more healthy beliefs. And, and then this other camp that says it's the common factors. It's the quality of the therapeutic relationship that should be good and healing and facilitative regardless of the modality you use. It's the uh, presence of unconditional positive regard. It's how, uh, how al aligned you are with the client on the goal, the objective for therapy. It's your therapeutic presence. You know, are you a good listener? Or do you reflect well? Uh, or do you have a judgmental vibe about you, <laughs> you know? Right. And so as I'm thinking about what psychotherapy is, we're talking about psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, ketamine assisted psychotherapy. What is the secret sauce that each one of these modalities brings to the inner healer and is it really that important what was your verdict back then when you studied these two schools of camp or where do you lie now because i mean i have yeah. my own opinion of of where it is and i'm always landing somewhere on the it's not this or that it's a little of this and a little of that yeah you know as uh, i eventually started calling myself an eclectic or an integrative therapist which some would say is a lazy way of saying, I just sort of do whatever works. Mm -hmm. But you want to be guided by a theory, right? right? We went to graduate school and got licensed for a reason. We're not just sort of showing up and being a professional friend. Um, and I also want to make sure that we're uh, evidence-based. The science, even though it's not physics and it's not chemistry, it's still science. And our variables are a little squishier because they're human variables. And we don't have direct access to love. I can't do an MRI and find the love center in your brain necessarily. Uh, it's all self-report. But um, so I, I, I try to follow the science, see what uh, the science suggests is effective, but also understand that our science is also very limited. Um, so eclectic, but less directive. I certainly experimented with doing a lot of CBT, um, a lot of acceptance and commitment therapy or ACT. Uh, drifted toward the more mindfulness-oriented therapies. And now recently, because I'm um, so passionate now about psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy, I'm getting very interested in the uh, body-focused, uh, emotion-focused therapy. So IFS, somatic experiencing, um, back to acceptance and commitment therapy, but uh, emotion-focused therapy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I see psychotherapy as one of the active ingredients in the process. You know, we've got the medicine that facilitates therapy in this case. You're not taking ketamine every day. You're taking, you're not even taking it every session. You're taking it some sessions. And as a trained and licensed psychotherapist, the difference between that and guiding or sitting seems to be the techniques, uh, the ability to assess the situation chart a course and employ one of those techniques as the active ingredient to either remove obstacles to facilitate the healing or gently guide someone on their path um, compared to you know holding a safe space alone mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i kind of look at it as 
the the common factors make me a good therapist and the specific factors make me do therapy well the specific fa- factors expertly and artfully employed right right exactly um, cuz i look at just this week i had a ketamine session for a woman who had a breakup of a long-term relationship and caused a lot of suicidal ideation there was potential hospitalization there it wasn't any intervention that mattered that day it was my expression of love that mattered to her mm-hmm. and that that's what made her say all right yeah there's love in my life and i have to accept that and yeah i want to die but i don't need to right that's beautiful it's not what you said it's how you made them feel right mm-hmm. which i guess if you wanted to get like nerdy about it that's that is an intervention you know out- sure they're coming to us. It's an odd relationship. Sure. They're paying for our time, but there's still authenticity and, and uh, connection, real connection with a therapist. Right. And that connection is healing. That authenticity is healing. To have somebody who will listen to you and pay attention to you and regard you in a way that almost nobody in your life probably will is, uh, yeah, it's incredibly healing. I saw a trailer the other day for a movie, a new movie coming out on Apple TV Plus or whatever it is, Mm -hmm. with Will Ferrell as the patient and Paul Rudd as the therapist. And it's about talk therapy. And uh, so Will Ferrell has some life kind of struggles, depressed, goes into therapy. He, He starts to make some rapid improvements and says, this is amazing. It's like I'm on drugs. I've never been in therapy. It's so cool. So awesome. And then... I don't even know how, how it goes or how it ends, but the last part of the trailer, he's sitting there in a session and connecting. There's so much empathy. And then all of a sudden, Paul Rudd as a therapist says, and our time's up. <laughs> See you next week. Yeah. <laughs> and he was just like, oh. deer in the headlights. Yeah. Wait, what just happened? Yeah. Which, that gets tough because if we're only looking at specific factors, I end my session on time to be able to hold my boundaries. <laughs> yeah. But if I want to be able to keep that relationship meaningful, then yeah, I've got to run a little late that day. And I like yeah. what um, Yalom says about the here and now work. So mm-hmm. like, even if it's a difficult conversation of you didn't pay your bill or you're you know, half an hour late every time and that's you know, making it difficult to do the work we need, that here and now stuff is uh, great content ripe for exploration together about common recurring themes in their life. You right. Know? Right. It's hard therapy to do. I, I, I don't think every, every therapist is well suited to here and now process like interpersonal process work because it, at least personally, I'll speak personally, it, it, yeah. it's more draining. I, mm-hmm. then, um, being more didactic or educational, like I might be, if I were doing CBT, because uh, I'm really in it with the person. You have to be a lot more more present, I think, to do that yeah. kind of yeah. work. Yeah, I see it as a, kind of a, a skill to de- that's developed over years and thousands of hours of doing the therapy work. Just like, you know, when you go to med school and residency, at first you learn the facts, the algorithms, what the muscles and bones are called, and you learn like how to run a code, you know, atropine, epinephrine, atropine, epinephrine. But then uh, you start to learn complex medical decision-making. How do you formulate what's called a differential diagnosis? I see this, I see that. What are the many things it could be? And how do you manage risk and make decisions using these principles you learned over all those years? And I see the same thing in like skilled group facilitators or individual therapists who can just navigate on seen unexpected things with skill and confidence and turn it into a therapeutic opportunity. Right. Yeah. And I, I think the, the ketamine itself makes for much more much more accessible in vivo moments to use in therapy because I think it's really intimidating for a lot of clients to be called out on the spot. And a lot of defensiveness can be worked up over really, really minuscule things that you're calling them out on you're five minutes late every time and they get very defensive when it's, hey, I just want you to leave your house five minutes earlier. And so the, the ketamine itself, I think, makes people more willing to accept the relationship as the meaningful part rather than the negative feedback is the mm-hmm. meaningful part of the relationship. 
And why do you think that is? I, I think it's the, the lowering of the defenses by itself, but I think there's also this sense of I'm allowed to make mistakes. I, I don't know what I could point out as what that active ingredient is on ketamine, but people are more willing to say, yeah, I screwed up. Yeah, because if... Uh, so. Th- Psychotherapy is this dialogue about someone's personal reality, right? And our personal narratives and rules and uh, what we think we know about the world, conditions, patterns, uh, show up in this default mode network, right? The Mm -hmm. neurobiological seat of the ego. And ketamine starts to loosen the grasp of that. And as you're in therapy, you're not automatically going to reflex into, you just pushed a button, screw you. Uh, for telling me I'm late like my dad always did. Right, like right. That. Yeah, it loosens that grasp, but also at the same time, it's turning on self-acceptance, I think. Mm-hmm. At yeah. the very least, like you called it before, Reed, it's chemical mindfulness or chemical perspective. It, I think it's the combination of those two things that makes it especially yeah. you know, useful in psychotherapy. Um, it's It doesn't just sort of turn off your default mode network and your left reeling, I guess, depending on the medicine and the dose, it might, <laughs> it might do that. But the, at least in therapy with ketamine, I've noticed it's also that increase in self, self-acceptance that would facilitate a here and now interaction about something like that that might otherwise trigger a defense. There's this paper from several years ago on ketamine-assisted psychotherapy by uh, an author named Kolk, K-O-L-K and colleagues that had this table that stuck with me. I, I revisited this countless times since. It talks about the ketamine experience at different dose levels and at first at a low dose. Um, without even calling it psycholytic, they start to describe what you're talking about, how it's heart opening. Um, it facilitates this openness, a sense of self-love and uh, gentleness towards self and others. and um, you know, letting your guard down a little bit. And then it gets into the higher kind of transpersonal realms um, as the ego dissolving starts to right. take more and more effect. And from what I understand from the MAPS research, um, the stuff done about MDMA and PTSD, that seems to be one of the big levers that's moving things for people is, oh, yeah. is the, the heart opening, self-acceptance, um, it, and uh, you know, decrease of fearful defenses around the trauma. One of my uh, mentors in MDMA therapy training said something once that uh, why they loved working with MDMA is because it made you feel like the best therapist in the world without hardly doing anything but holding <laughs> space. And it's true. I've, I've seen it uh, play out where uh, that inner healer is the secret sauce mm-hmm. to transformation and healing. So if that's the case, then all these different modalities that we could pair with psychedelics are, I'm just thinking out loud here, but they are different tools to help our clients get access to the inner healer or different tools to help our clients uncage the inner healer. And some client, for whatever reason, might need EMDR as that tool, right? They have an EMDR-shaped keyhole and (laughs) need the EMDR key to open it. Maybe somebody, uh, for whatever reason, can't do that or doesn't respond well to that and they need something like acceptance and commitment therapy to pair with their particular psychedelic and i do think there are multiple paths up the mountain for most people right Uh, and there's some they might say hell no i'm not doing that but there might be half a dozen others where uh, they get them there even if it meanders a little more than the other path might have been right and so acceptance and commitment therapy is probably my favorite generic therapy to pair with ketamine where Steve Hayes would probably be mad that you called it generic <laughs> <laughs> I apologize to apologies him. to Steve Hayes. Steve if you're listening yeah. Yeah. oh please it's a rip off of three other therapies combined just like every other modality nobody is. knows that <laughs> <laughs> and He's so we all, all steal, secrets. Yeah, we all steal from each other <laughs> yeah right? it's uh I do have a book that's called like steal like an artist yeah, yeah. Um, But I like acceptance and commitment therapy for ketamine, especially because you have a strong acceptance component, which is dramatically enhanced by ketamine. The ability to accept flaws, strengths, compliments, hatreds, rejections, so much easier. And then you have the classic therapy homework aspect of the committed action. Mm -hmm. And so the acceptance 
is focused on during the ketamine trips themselves and then the commitment action the week following great integration homework it's you know. fantastic oh, yeah. it really sets itself up for success as long as the person follows through on the homework mm -hmm. and so I, I love acceptance and commitment for ketamine pairing because it's quick and short and gets to the point and you see results quick as long as the person can really learn how to tolerate distress yeah, I feel like the, the concept from ACT of cognitive fusion and defusion mm -hmm. is, I think, explained well by that default mode network, mm -hmm. um, Rebus model, uh, and like ketamine and other psychedelics being the solvent for a fused consciousness. Right. Yeah. Is that one of the ACT metaphors? <laughs> <laughs> one, of, one of the many. Yeah. 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 And so I, I like that one a lot as the generic because I, I look at EMDR and it's fantastic at single event non-attachment trauma. Mm. Um, now I will get yelled at by my trainers when I mm -hmm. say, I don't find it my go-to for serious childhood attachment-based trauma. I don't see the results that I would with ketamine alone or ketamine with EMDR for attachment-based trauma. Um, but if you had a car crash as an adult, huh, EMDR, absolutely. One or two sessions, you're fine. Yeah. That's very interesting. And can you explain a little on why? Is it because of some of those complex cases have a series of big T, little t traumas scattered throughout one's early right. life? And I guess the simple version would be my assumption is that when you have an attachment trauma, those negative beliefs about self and the world are so vast and varied that a singular traumatic event has a dozen negative beliefs associated to it where a car crash, well, mine was a fear of life, or a singular um, non-attachment-based sexual trauma is going to be a lot different than an attachment-based sexual trauma because the messages about who I am and the world around me are dramatically different when there's attachment. We mm -hmm. just had an interesting insight about this. Uh, we uh, had access to a lecture from Besser, Bessel van der Kolk about MDMA, like, like really current MDMA research and trauma. And one of the things he noted was he suspected early on that, uh, kind of like you're saying with EMDR, that this MDMA work wouldn't be really good for people with early attachment-based trauma, what he called you know developmental trauma, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, that was his suspicion, and it turns out, uh, or the early MDMA data suggests that it's actually better for those folks. Hmm. The, like the, the the outcomes are actually even a little bit better for the early attachment trauma folks than it is for the sentinel event later in life trauma folks. He was telling them, don't even include them in your study because it's not going to work. And he was shocked by how well it's working. Yeah, and you can see why that might be based on what Bob was describing about. That how pervasive the attachment wounding can be, how tightly held it is, and how much uh, room there is to improve one's life if you can turn to a state of self-love, which MDMA does so quickly. Right. Yeah. I mean, when you think about these folks that have been uh, attachment trauma from early in life, in the times in your life when you're laying down the foundations of, of relationship to self, like these people might not have, not have have ever had any experience or memory with that kind of self-love. They were taught from the yeah. get-go that they were unlovable or they were a burden or they were bad. So to have something like MDMA that can give you that feeling, um, like I always say, that might not otherwise be accessible to you, what an incredible tool Oh yeah, for trauma work. Yeah, that is uh, absolutely game-changing when you look at it like that, to feel self-love in an in a complete embodied way. And we've seen it with our eating disorder clients, not just in uh, some MDMA work, but in ketamine mm -hmm. as well, like having an experience of positive uh, self-regard, positive body image, um, love for oneself, even if it's only there for 15 minutes, mm -hmm. is very powerful uh, in terms of doing the work to access that in day-to-day -day life. Yeah, and, and that's a big piece of it doesn't matter what modality I'm using, is how do we integrate and recreate these sensations and feelings that were experienced on ketamine? And mm -hmm. doesn't matter the modality, we have to focus on that if we want long-term results from this ketamine. Yeah, that's where the magic meets the road in all this, or is 
in the gaps in between dosing right. sessions. I was looking at uh, earlier today, in fact, looking at that recent psilocybin study of Lexapro versus psilocybin, where all the headlines said um, psilocybin just as good as antidepressants. It's not really the case. It was a small study. Psilocybin did better on all the key measures mm-hmm. than Lexapro, but it had a relatively modest sample size, so you couldn't conclude. So it's like they're accurate headlines, but they're not showing how response rate was substantially higher on, on say, psilocybin. But what I found interesting was in the psilocybin group, you had two doses of medicine. And in the other group, it was daily doses of Lexapro, which was 43 days. And so in that case, uh, that's the active ingredient. Lexapro, like meds, med-only treatment for depression versus therapy, which is doing the work every day. It's not just what's in your once a week session or in your six hour psilocybin assisted psychotherapy session. It's what you do every day to make it stick. Right. And I I think it's intimidating for a lot of people of, well, I I can't recreate that experience. I've never felt anything like that before. Mm -hmm. How am I supposed to recreate that? And it's, it's really we want to oversimplify the ways that we're recreating it. And so an individual I was working with this week, he was talking about the peaceful brain that exists after ketamine and wanting to be able to recreate that. And then he started realizing, oh, when I read a chapter in a book and then shut the book and think about what I read, that's my brain state at that time. Mm. And all that takes is 15 minutes. Or another person who was saying like that floating sensation of just going and existing and not having to think about every step along the way. Yeah, that one's going to be harder to recreate, but if we put our brain and intention in what the experience is, being more mindful, and it takes practice, it takes investment, but this is something that can absolutely be recreated Mm -hmm. with a little bit of effort, especially once you've opened that experiential door. Now that I've felt that sensation, I can definitely feel it again. Yeah, yeah, you're laying down the tracks and repeating them, even in small ways, to make them stick. And sometimes we'll tell people to have a special playlist for their ketamine session Mm -hmm. so they can and keep it reserved for recreating that experience, revisit it in your contemplative practices, in your integration homework, rather than the same playlist you listen to while kind of rocking out to the dishes or um, grocery shopping. Yeah. And however you can simplify that reminder of how to integrate with that. I had one individual who was commenting that they always have to pee after they're done with the ketamine experience and it Mm -hmm. feels like the biggest urination that they can come up with ever. (laughs) And that one of the messages they got is that we're all animals and I'm just a cow peeing in the pasture. And that's (laughs) an easy one to reconnect with because how many times are you gonna pee in a day that you can just remind yourself, Yeah, uh, life is a lot simpler than I'm giving it credit for. Yeah, little that's a that's a fun yeah. mantra, a little different than I am loving awareness. Like that, but uh, I like I am it. a cow in a pasture. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> it reminds me of my, uh, Michael Pollan's description in uh, How to Change Your Mind. He's talking about going to the bathroom. I think during a psilocybin oh, yeah. trip. And he, I think he described it as like, you know, the urine leaving my body was like a cascade of diamonds <laughs> crashing, <laughs> into the, crashing into the ocean. A beautiful description. Beautiful. Urination. Didn't the mushroom guide turn into like Maria Sabina yeah. or something like yeah. that? Yeah, I think he looked in the mirror too and he, <laughs> he like transformed into his father or something. I can't remember. Mm-hmm. Looked older, aged. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, something else you said I think is worth highlighting um, of getting out of the way of the medicine and the healing process. Um, you know, there's a lot of work to do as a therapist, but there's a risk there of, of inserting ourselves too much in a way. And, right. and the MAPS therapy training has this acronym, WAIT. Why am I talking? Or, or one of the big takeaways for me was just like, get out of the way of the medicine. Just uh, remembering that so we can hold space, so we can guide, so we can insert the therapeutic interventions you know at the right time and place but it's really the healing comes from within right and i think the things we do that we've been calling the secret sauces you know that they can shape and direct the medicine experience we just don't want that shaping or directing like reed's saying to get in the way of the important work the inner healer does i hear about you know um 
the different ways that uh, like different guides or, or ayahuasca shamans might run their retreats, you know, or they might run their, their therapeutic experiences. And they can really vary everything from, you know, like we're going to be dancing, uh, we're going to be interacting to if you make a sound, I'm putting you in a different tent, you know. Um, or the type of music that they're that they're playing or listening to, everything from like screeching death metal to just chanting or drums, and they they occasion different experiences, I think, but they aren't the active ingredients, right? The the thing that's going to be doing the healing, doing the changing, we think, is this inner healer that the psychedelics give us access to. So, but what we do as therapists matters. Like you need to get training, folks. Like if you want to be a psychedelic assisted therapist. Work hard on being a good therapist. Yeah. Whatever modality you choose, mm-hmm. uh, we think these non-directive ones are better suited, probably. I, I would not want to do CBT in a psycholytic session. Mm. I would be okay with doing CBT after a psychedelic session or after a psycholytic experience, but I, I wouldn't want to use a very directive, logical therapy when they're in a psycholytic dose. Why do you think that is? It's just too uh, too, too heady. Yeah, and it's it's going to basically take someone and throw them in a rut and then kick them down the water slide and say, "Okay, that's the way you're going." Why did we give them the medicine if that's what we're doing? I think CBT is great. This is not me ditching on it at all. It's right. just saying I don't think it's a great combination, and if acceptance and commitment therapy didn't have the strong strong acceptance and spiritual side of it i'd kick that out the window too Hmm. yeah i mean if you're watching this on youtube audience and you disagree leave a comment you know yeah give us some feedback former emdr trainers i'll be looking forward to hear your disses about emdr (laughs) is not great for attachment trauma (laughs) as a child (laughs) i'm sure we'll have plenty of people disagree (laughs) so i know we've all seen it but uh Psilocybin, the Yale folks released a manual of psilocybin assisted psychotherapy. Uh, you know, a very good, long, detailed, and I think uh, well put together therapy manual, and it's based on ACT. Mm. Yeah, and there's another one, um, and I'm, I'm struggling to remember. We'll link these in the show notes, folks, but I'm struggling to remember what it's called. I th- it's basically like a harm reduction approach yeah. to psychedelic assisted therapy um, and just give some general overall broadly applicable guidelines on how to approach psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. Yeah, so, like H- Hakomi. Is that mm. more like along the lines of clinicians who are doing psychedelic assisted therapy where it's not necessarily legal? It's like pe- people coming in who maybe are, you know, they're doing their own psychedelic work. Right, okay. And so this is how you can support their work in an ethical way that's still um, captured under your license um, and you're not doing anything that's sure unapproved yeah yeah say more about Hakomi Reed. you're the one that introduced me to that I wasn't familiar with that I know Bob did a bit of a deep dive on that do yeah. you recall what stood out to you it the way it <laughs> this is my own problem but it mm-hmm. reminded me of act and CBT smashed together with more spiritual wording and a very gentle approach yes. that kind of honors and respects the journey, the autonomy of the individual and pays a lot of attention to the presence and the relationship. Yeah, but it, it did feel like another book that I was reading that was smashing three therapies together. And mm-hmm. oh, But I, I liked the, the, I don't remember any specifics, but the spiritual wording was very comforting in the way that it was going about it. So it seemed yeah. more like a journey rather than an adjustment yeah and I, I i quite like it and think it's really well suited for psychedelic therapy because of those reasons because of its gentle non-directive approach because of the transpersonal components and in fact uh one of uh my favorite maps trainers one of the lead trainers in boulder marcella Otolora. she's hakomi trained and mm. and is informed by that um and, and that reminds me, I was at a, a conference, this was a couple of years ago, Psychedelic Science Conference. Tim Ferriss was interviewing her on stage for a podcast. And I've, I've heard that episode. Yeah. yeah. And he asked, I forget what he asked her, but um, he was asking her about, uh, about how to become a psychedelic therapist or important features. And she said, you know, the only way to um, really hold someone through their suffering help them through is to not be afraid of your own 
and it it highlighted the need for personal work and sure. widening that container to be able to to hold this as someone goes through that dark night of the soul and not get you know triggered and uh dysregulated yourself right? yeah yeah i remember my uh dissertation chair telling me steve if you want to be a good therapist you got to take care of your own shit yeah and, uh, i've been in therapy ever since <laughs> <laughs> on and off yeah I'd, I'd say with psycholytic therapy that i've done what i've had to watch out most for in myself is distractibility when they're going through like a four or five minute moment of silence where they're doing an internal process mm. And the hardest part is really staying present with them while I'm just letting them sit, experience, and think. And that's been difficult. Yeah. Because you want to uh, intervene or because you might get distracted and your mind might wander? It's a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. Because there's this internal training clock that is the engineer inside of me that says, if you haven't done anything productive in five minutes, meaning if you have time to lean, you have time to clean, so get to work. (laughs) Oh, that's tough to get past. But then also yeah. sitting in silence with somebody while their eyes are shut and they're in their own journey. And I'm wondering what it is, but have no idea what it is until they tell me. It just gets boring. I think it's a really important point you bring up, though, um, that uh, our presence matters a lot mm-hmm. during the psychedelic experience. Mm-hmm. I learned this long ago when doing yoga teacher training uh, from one of my teachers. Uh, we were, you know, learning the whole process of taking people through the poses, the asanas, and then you end in this kind of meditative, vulnerable state of complete re- relaxation that you call shavasana. And I remember asking a teacher, what do I do while they're in shavasana? He's like, you hold space. You meditate and you create the safe container. You guard the energy of this place so they can, you know, like let all that work they just did, you know, travel through them and do the healing. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, so I've remembered that as we go into psychedelic therapy of, it might be tempting to go on your phone when someone's sitting there for an hour uh, and having an internal experience. But but I I really believe that our presence then matters Mm -hmm. of being present and holding space and the, uh, the, attunement and the energy between you and the client um, through the whole experience right yeah and remember like you don't have to be a fully actualized flawless human being to be a a psychotherapist Um, I think having some some awareness about your um, shortcomings your like tendencies like you were describing a second ago Bob being distracted the awareness is really important if I had to say a quality that that every new therapist should really work on, it's just self-awareness first, yeah. getting really familiar with your triggers so that when they are evoked, and they will be by your therapy clients, at the very least, you're not doing some counter-transference, right? You're not, you're not blasting yeah. it upon them. And right. Like for me, I sometimes have some discomfort around intense displays of emotion, which is like, why did you get into this job, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> Wonder where that came from. Yeah, can you believe it? I think it's precisely what sent me into this job, but... So do you want to talk about countertransference for a moment? I know most yeah. uh, clinicians pay attention to it or should, but... Yeah, to find I'll give it a shot and you can correct me where I get it wrong, mm-hmm. guys. But uh, transference, this was, I think, first a concept introduced in the, anal- in the uh, analytic type of psychotherapies, you know, Freud, Jung, Adler. Um, the idea that uh, a patient would transfer onto you as a therapist a relationship that they have to someone else in their life, usually their parents, right, a primary caregiver. And that was an important part of the therapy process because as it's happening, you can then react differently to them than their parent did, and they have a corrective experience. Countertransference is the other direction where the therapist transfers something onto the client that is more about their BS and less about the client's BS. And that can be, uh, it can also be important because it can be, uh, you can, I think, use it, wield it therapeutically, yeah. but it also can be a stumbling block if you're not aware of it. And, you know, you're seeming annoyed at this client, and it's not because they're being annoying. It's because you have a problem with that particular thing that they're doing. Yeah. No, I like that. It's an example of what you just said before, that awareness is key. Mm-hmm. Without awareness, you're just getting triggered and uh, bringing up your old biases or patterns. But with awareness, it can be quite diagnostic or they can be signposts for where the work lies right. and uh, for where your own work lies under yeah. this uh, 
the obstacle as a path idea or triggers in clients in us as well are friends to follow. Mm -hmm. And I think with that awareness, when you build really good expert self-awareness, then your nervous system, your emotions, your reactions become a really good instrument, a really good diagnostic instrument, um, a good uh, therapeutic instrument. But if without Mm -hmm. it, it just, you know, can get in the way. Yeah. Do you want to talk about co-regulation, either of you, for a moment? I think that's an important, relevant factor. You know, that immediately brought to my mind something I saw on Nicola Perez's uh, Instagram. The, the What does she call herself? The Holistic Psychologist. Mm-hmm. It just came out with her, her book, uh, How to Do the Work. I like her stuff, but she was talking about co-regulation in a post. And she's sitting, you know, cross-legged across from another person. And they both each have their hands on each other's yeah. hearts. And they're breathing and they're co-regulating, uh, syncing up their heart rate and their, their respiration rhythm. Yeah. So that's a pretty intense way to do it. But um, what do you think and read with uh, therapy I, clients? I can't count the number of times even that I've uh, got in there with clients and, you know, to um, breathe with them or set or help them set a rhythm where their breathing is, is fast. You can slow it down or uh, you could even do the opposite and, and get someone out of a kind of despairing, defeated place from your energy your right. your mirroring uh, but there's this kind of therapy it actually happens in Utah uh, uh, somewhere in between here and Salt Lake City where there are a lot of horses called Mustang therapy yeah, I've heard of it. <laughs> where you go in and you co-regulate with a wild Mustang by putting your heart on theirs chest to chest and syncing up your heartbeats <laughs> I haven't tried it but those who have who I've talked to say it's uh, one of the wildest interesting uh, experiences to see how how you can do that but if if you have pets you know like you have cats right Uh, your energy matters big time they are energy detectors as as anyone is on a psychedelic medicine right yeah I have many scars to prove that I even saw on on reddit once uh, someone posted about their cat this was someone a recreational drug user who said this guys this is weird but my cat behaves so differently every time I'm on a different substance if I come home on Adderall the cat is like bounce off the walls I come home on LSD they're behaving this way I come home on opiates they're they're doing this it was really fascinating yeah yeah animals are so much more sensitive to things like that I, yeah. I'm convinced they have these like electromagnetic sensors that we just don't have they have access to, to energy spectrums that that we don't that's my woo-woo statement. Like hearing a dog whistle. Yeah. 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 You guys can't hear those? <laughs> huh. Bob's a werewolf. <laughs> we found out. Well, gentlemen, I've enjoyed the conversation. Any other, before we wrap up, any other ideas about uh, therapeutic, therapeutic modalities that are good combinations for uh, psychedelic work? Without going into detail of what they are, my favorites are acceptance and commitment, mind-body bridging, some tenets of emotion-focused therapy, and EMDR for trauma. Hmm. That's a good list. Yeah, I'm thinking about uh, this might be the first time we have a medicine that's FDA-approved in combination with a therapy, right? With the, yeah. the FDA approval of MDMA for the treatment of PTSD. Um, and so what that therapy ends up being, I guess, is in the hands of MAPS. But it, it sounds like it's, it's patterned after IFS. Well, that's a, a component of it mm-hmm. is, you know, psychedelic medicines, whether it's MDMA, ketamine or others, they do uh, create this state where someone might start to go into parts work or you can see the parts uh, with a new perspective. And so the MDMA therapy manual uses IFS type principles if uh, someone starts going into right. parts work and then you're like oh I know what to do right you go there and, and IFS doesn't have a monopoly on parts work right a lot of therapies yeah. uh, approach us from that perspective of internal parts yeah but there is a, a connection there where Dick Schwartz uh, creator of IFS goes way back with Michael Mitoffer mm-hmm. who's led the MDMA work and, uh, and I believe uh, Michael Mittoffer was like a trainee or a resident working with Dick, Sh- Dick Schwartz back in the day. Mm. And so we, we brought uh, Dick in to give a series of lectures for the 
eating disorder study training of MDMA therapists and um, you know Phil Wolfson mm -hmm. one of our teachers just brought him in to give a lecture to the ketamine therapy group as you know yeah and so it is a, it is a, uh, an especially well suited and uh, popular one right now for pairing with psychedelics but but I agree that concept of parts work is an important an important one and there are many approaches including even in the emotion focus world right yeah, it does present some training challenges. I know there's a lot of folks who are interested in becoming psychedelic assisted psychotherapists and trained as such. Um, we'll see what the future holds. Uh, we're certainly, you know, here at Nova Mind trying to put together robust training packages, and um, there's a lot of good stuff out there. But thanks, gentlemen. Appreciate your willingness to talk about yeah. this important topic. Thanks Thank for you. having me. Thank you for joining us today. Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers is brought to you by Novamind, a mental health company that specializes in psychedelic medicine and research. You can learn more about Novamind's mission to increase access to legal, safe, and evidence-based psychedelic medicine at novamind.ca. If you like what you heard today, please subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you're using to listen or watch. Also, if you're feeling generous today, please leave us a glowing review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you like to listen. This will help us get into the ears and faces of more people and help us put wind in the sails of the psychedelic medicine renaissance. Thanks for listening.